This panel discussion will be hosted by our very well-known Lambda Days program committee member, John Hughes, and attended by guests with enthusiastic, or not so much, views on types. Guests include Stephanie, Nikki, Edwin, Adam, and Thorsten. What a dream team. <laughs> Let's begin. John, over to you. OK. Thank you very much, Michelle. So uh, welcome, everybody, to the panel session on dependent types. I've got um, five experts on the topic in the virtual studio with me. And uh, I'd just like to kick off by asking uh, each of them to introduce themselves briefly. Adam, would you like to start? Sure, I can start. Hello, everyone. I'm Adam Chapala. I'm a professor at MIT in computer science. And my connection to dependent types is twofold. Most of my research at MIT is about machine check proofs of correctness using a theorem prover called Koch, which some of you may know has dependent type theory as its foundation. Though it's kind of interesting, you don't need to necessarily use the dependent types directly to get a lot of mileage out of Koch, and, and that kind of theme might come up uh, in the rest of the discussion. I'm also the designer and implementer of a programming language called Urweb, which is a domain-specific functional language for web applications and is strongly inspired by dependent types to support such features as fancy statically typed metaprogramming. And by the way, I'm trying to start off a startup building on Urweb, so I'd love to hear from people who might want to get involved in that sort of thing. And Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Edwin Brady. I'm a lecturer in computer science at the University of St. Andrews, where mostly I teach programming language related things. So, so everything from uh, JavaScript up to Haskell. Um, but in my, in my <laughs> copious free time or my research time, um, I like working with a dependently typed programming language uh, called uh, Idris, which no doubt will, uh, no doubt I'll talk quite a bit more about over the next uh, hour or so. That's it. Uh, hello, my name is Nikki Vazu. I am a research assistant professor at India Software in Spain. And uh, I am one of the developers and I still work on, work on Liquid Haskell, which is a refinement type checker for um, <clears throat> Haskell programs. I guess we'll discuss more in this hour, but in general, you can see refinement types as a uh, restriction of dependent types, which has some advantages and some disadvantages. Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie Wyrick. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And um, my connection to dependent types is twofold. So like Adam, I also use the Cock Proof Assistant to uh, do proofs about uh, programming language meta theory and also to prove the correctness of functional programs. But in addition to that, I have this 20 year long secret mission to convince the developers of GHC to add features of dependently typed languages to the Haskell programming language. And uh, it's been a lot of fun and has, uh, I think, um, improved Haskell for the better. And uh, so I hope to continue doing that in the future. And Torsten. Okay. Hi, yeah. I'm uh, Torsten Altenkirch, uh, professor at the University of Nottingham. And I, I have been, yeah, I've been a developer a long time ago. And somehow I ended up on this quest to look for better and better languages. And uh, maybe I'm still looking for the perfect language. Uh, so uh, yeah, I started doing type theory quite a while ago with different systems, a Lego system we had. Uh, we had a system called ALF in Sweden. And most recently, I've been mainly working with ACTA. And my recent uh, publications have a lot to do with a very hot uh, version of type theory. OK, thank you. OK, so uh, I realize that um, we probably have very varied backgrounds where dependent types are concerned. So just to make sure that we start off on the same page, uh, Toshten, can you give us an, a brief introduction to the subject? Toshten, I believe you're muted. Yeah, that happens. That happens all the time. Okay. 
Uh, what I was saying when you couldn't hear is that two, two years ago, I actually gave a, a talk at Lambda Days entitled Why Dependent Types Matter. Uh, now, I, I can't really repeat this now, but just let me try to give a very short overview. So my, my main, well, the main point is that dependent types are actually everywhere. So even in the old Haskell from the previous millennium, Haskell 98 had dependent types. And what is a dependent type? It's a type which depends on some values. And if you, if you use Haskell, and you write list of A, or brackets A, uh, then it's a dependent type because it depends on A, which is another type. Uh, however, uh, this sort of dependent types, which comes from polymorphism, isn't really the exciting bit. The exciting bit is what we call full-blown dependent types, when we can have types which don't just depend on other types, but also depends on, on arbitrary values. And the most famous and overused example is a type of lists of a fixed length, or arrays of a fixed length, or what we call vectors, which depend on a number. And this number uh, is, uh, can be any, any sort of computation. Um, at this point, I think I would like to uh, share a meme. Let's see whether I managed to do this. Uh, a picture. Can you see the picture? Does this work? No, it doesn't. Okay. So, okay, that failed. Oh, no, now it is. Okay. Uh, this is uh, uh, from an old talk by, by my friend and colleague, Connor McBride, who tried to illustrate uh, dependent types uh, using uh, the analogy of a proletarian revolution, you see. So the workers, which are the terms, are on the left side of the colon, and on the right-hand side of the colon are the capitalists, the bourgeoisie. And uh, dependent types means that the, the workers who do all the work eventually mar march through the colon and, and get into the world, uh, world of, of types. And luckily, instead of uh, like a horrible, bloody conflict, actually the types, the blue uh, guys here, they're actually quite happy uh, uh, to, to see these, these terms because they're, they're more expressive. And then the guy says, oh, that's a spade. I, oh, I understand what's going on. So, um, but in a way, this also shows you uh, some issues with dependent types. So once uh, the, the workers go into these like very uh, nice rooms where usually the bourgeoisie is, is, is placing, they have to be well behaved. And often we have a problem that uh, the terms are not so well behaved and they may not terminate and, and so on. And, and, and that's a big technical issue to do with dependent types. Now, the history of dependent types goes back to a Swedish uh, logician uh, called Pierre Martin Löw, who actually uh, used dependent types uh, to do logic, he uses a proposition as types or Curry Howard equivalents. And this is the reason why we find, find nowadays uh, lots of these logical systems like Koch and Lee and so uh, 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 using dependent types. However, uh, today, I think we are more interested in, 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 in programming. And I have got another meme. Let me see whether I, whether I manage this uh, again. OK. It will take a few minutes. Uh, if I'm lucky, then that will, my other meme will show up. And this meme is about the, con the, the tension between dynamic typing and static typing, yeah? So, uh, and you see this dynamic typing uh, is, is, is really popular and, and, and people get something done very quickly, but then it may not be uh, the right thing. Whereas the guy doing the static typing, it's a bit more complicated, but hopefully when he's finished, it, it, will, it will be uh, uh, really the nice, uh, the right thing. And I think this shows also this, this, this tension because I think if you really want to do static typing, there's basically no way to avoid dependent types, to be expressive enough to catch, to, to, to really express uh, your programs, uh, which you want to say. But it is, is, is a hard job. And, and so this, this tension between dynamic typing and static typing be, uh, using dependent types, I think uh, is, is, is 
maybe uh, something which we should uh, discuss today. So that's all. That's, I'm finished with my introduction. OK, thank you, Tosh, then. So the first question that I want to ask uh, all of you actually is suppose that um, maybe I've never used dependent types, but I'm really interested. I'd like to try them out. Maybe I'd like to use them as part of uh, the current system I'm building. What would you recommend? What tools should I use? What language should I use? And where should I try to apply dependent types to succeed for the first time? Uh, Stephanie, would you like to start? OK, um, so I have a couple of answers to your question, right? Because it kind of the, the answer kind of depends on who you are, right? So if you're a Haskell developer, then I think you should try to play with some of the features in the language that you know already, it, it, some of the features in Haskell, and look around at some Haskell libraries that take advantage of the more dependently typed-like features, such as, for example, the, the Singletons library that was authored by Richard Eisenberg is a strong support for dependent types. And you might look at both that library itself and then applications of that library. There's a lot of good blog posts and tutorials about how to do dependently typed like programming in Haskell. So Haskell doesn't have what Torsten would call full spectrum dependent types, but it can get fairly close in certain ways. And so you can learn a lot about that system. Now, if you're not a Haskell developer and you're not very comfortable in Haskell, or if you want to see what full spectrum dependent types are, I strongly suggest that you look at a language that is very much designed for dependently typed programming, like Idris or Agda. And I'll let Torsten and Edwin tell you a little bit more about how great those languages are. Well, Edwin, that sounds like your cue. Uh, yes, I suppose it is. Um, so <laughs> going back to what your, your question was, I suppose it would be very odd if I didn't answer that question by saying, well, you should download Idris and you should give it a go. <laughs> um, so uh, what I generally recommend people do is, is um, you know, go to the tutorial and, and follow through the tutorial. So if, if you know a bit of Haskell in particular, if you know functional programming in general, uh, then a lot of the concepts will be uh, reasonably familiar. And I'm told by people coming from other backgrounds, so let's say Scala programmers, uh, that going directly to Idris is, is entirely fine because you know, if you're going to dependent types in Haskell, you have all of the baggage of you know, Haskell's history that, that has to still be there. Whereas with Idris, we've started again, you know, clean slate. What does, it, what does it take to build a dependently typed language that uh, kind of does something interesting? So clearly, I'm going to recommend Idris as the, the, the tool to try, just, just because I have to. Uh, also, I suppose it would also be silly not to say, uh, buy my book. It's great. Uh, work, work through the exercises. The exercises are in the order they are for a good reason. So it's, it's supposed to take you gradually from um, knowing nothing about dependent types to actually working with them. The second part of your question is, what should I do? What, what sort of thing should I work on? And um, I, I'm always looking for interesting places where we can apply dependent types because, you know, again, naturally I would. You know, I, I don't want to feel that I've got a solution looking for a problem here, even if it might look to all observers that I do. Um, the kind of thing that Idris seems to be good for is the kind of thing that functional programming in general is good for, which is, again, this is an odd thing to say, making new programming languages. Functional programming languages are really good for, for making more programming languages. Why would you do that? Well, maybe you're working in a particular domain. You've got domain experts who know the domain really well. There are a lot of properties that you need to maintain in that domain. So dependent types and functional programming allow you to um, give tools to domain experts to express problems in the language of their domain. And the dependent types allow you to restrict things so that uh, only only legal programs are representable. Um, so it's going to depend on the domain you, domain you work in. Maybe there's some properties that you want to express that you just can't do in your current favorite programming language. So maybe give it a try in a, in a dependently typed language. So Tosh, I think you also uh, were queued to say something about Agda. Oh. Uh, no, I, I just want to comment on what Edwin uh, said. Um, 
Yeah, so Akta is a cool language, and Idris uh, are cool languages, and I don't really want to, to make a choice between these two. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, what Edwin just said, these domain-specific languages, this is really uh, the killer application for dependent types. Because, I mean, I actually, a while ago, I wrote um, uh, a, a quantum I.O. monad uh, for quantum computation in Haskell. And there were lots of uh, side conditions which had to do with what you actually can do in a hypothetical quantum computer, which I couldn't express in, in Haskell. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, I never finished this project, I have to admit this, but it was very clear that when we use dependent types, these are exactly conditions uh, uh, we can ex express. So whatever is your domain is exactly what Edwin says. This is a killer up for dependent types. Nikki, would you like to comment on this? Yes. Um, OK, uh, where to start and what to use, right? Uh, nobody could add them. I think if you want to do like a hardcore meta theory or to prove very difficult properties, uh, you, you can go with full-blown trusted dependent types and try Coke and Adam's book is a very good intro um, <clears throat> to Coke. Uh, but now, if you are a Haskell programmer and you want to do more light verification, I would suggest like uh, using Liquid Haskell. Uh, as of recently, it is a GT plugin, so it is quite easy to install it. And uh, you can just add the flag into your Cabal installation file, and then Liquid Haskell runs on the background. And then if you want to do light verification, it is very convenient. And by light, I mean uh, things like um, uh, proof termination or proof uh, <clears throat> integer properties. Now, if you want to do more fancy verification, you could do it in Liquid Haskell if you want to uh, experiment and reach bugs because this is a new feature. But uh, otherwise, like if you, if you want to prove very fancy properties and you can go outside of Haskell, you don't mind that, I think you can use dependent types. And uh, Adam? I would first say that there's something of a historical accident in which features of programming languages were first associated with dependent types. And we should tease apart some of these and decide which of them are appropriate for which use cases. And the big one that I'd call out is an expressive system for type level computation, which you can do even if you don't have dependent types. If you have a clear segregation between types and, and programs, you can still take advantage of a copy of Lambda calculus in your type system to express some interfaces that you can't express soundly otherwise. So I would definitely suggest uh, maybe starting with a language that has type level computation, but not so-called full spectrum dependent typing. I think some of what we've heard about the uh, extensions like singletons to, to Haskell is, is sort of in that direction. I'd also echo to some extent what, what Edwin said, and I phrase it like this. Um, dependent types, like so many parts of functional programming, are really well suited to symbolic processing which I believe is a very small fraction of programming in the world today, but a very large fraction of programming done by people who design dependently typed languages. So we can easily get, we can sort of trick ourselves about the, the relative applicability of, of these ideas. But beyond designing a programming language or a compiler, another place you see symbolic processing matter is in, well, you might call this a special case of a compiler. Various examples of metaprogramming or code generators where you, have, you build a library that you think of as taking in some parameters and then it, it builds a specialized version of itself for you. I found, for instance, in the Urweb language that type level computation is very effective for describing the contract of this kind of code generator and helping you check that this generator is always going to work in any particular circumstances that, that are expressed by choosing parameter values. So that's my advice. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about how you make use of dependent types in, in a larger program. I mean, I know how to check that my lists are the right length and how to use vectors. But well, uh, you know, if, you, if you're going to um, uh, build a web application with a database behind it, or you're going to write a compiler, how do you, where do you get the most out of dependent types for that kind of application? Adam, let, let's stick with you first. Yes. 
Okay, so I want to choose to answer this question in terms of maybe like advanced functional programming instead of dependent types, in particular type level computation where you, where you have a, a copy of type lambda calculus in your type system. And if you're building a web application backed by a database, there are all sorts of interesting places where you want to put rich types on things. You want to use what are called row types or basically uh, kind of extensible record types to explain ingredients like the schema of your database and what, what, what fields are available and the result of a particular query you run against your database. But then you also want to be able to write some operations that are generic so that they work on many different databases that have some commonality to their, their shapes. Like you might want to be able to build a component that gives you a generic UI widget for viewing all the contents of one of your database tables. And it's natural to express the type of that widget in terms of computations that take in certain database schemas and compute other related schemas. And you can express those translations very nicely in Lambda Calculus. And you can do it in a language where the compiler is able to check the implementation of your generic database contents viewer. It's able to do essentially some kind of uh, mathematical theorem proving for you automatically at compile time and establish that this, th this viewer is going to work correctly for any database schema that meets the constraints that you set out in the type of that component. And I found this to be a really effective code reuse strategy, not super connected to full functional correctness or any of those goals that people sometimes aim for with dependent types. It's more like sanity checks about the shapes of things, but up one level of meta. Edwin, I think you wanted to say something about um, using dependent types in the compiler. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I was just thinking, uh, I can't really help you with web applications because I think the last one I wrote was a hacky PHP script to, tack, tack, to track Go ratings at Durham Go Club in about 2003. So that's a little bit out of date there. But I do know about compilers, or a little bit about compilers. Um, so Idris 2 is now uh, written in Idris 2, which is kind of cool. Uh, and we've... Um, taken advantage of dependent types in that implementation to, because um, there's, there's certain things that can go wrong when you're writing a compiler all the time. And I think if you've, if you've worked with programming languages, it's always naming. So, so, so naming is really hard to get right for all kinds of reasons. So at the beginning, uh, I spent quite a while trying to, you know, looking for ways of using the type system uh, to make it so that I couldn't make naming errors. Um, so there's really just one place in the system where we're using dependent types a lot, and that is in the core representation of terms. So the core representation of Idris2 programs in the Idris2 compiler is uh, indexed by the names that are in scope. So every manipulation we do on a term um, is, is kind of, it has to be paired at compile time with the environment that it's working in. So it's impossible to, for example, run a unification problem with two terms in the wrong environment. And that's a mistake I kept making in Idris 1. Or it's, it's impossible for the evaluator to, to work with a term that's in the wrong scope. Again, a mistake that I just kind of, if I was half asleep, slipped into in, in Idris 1 quite a bit. And it turns out having that core representation with the important invariant you want to maintain um, just then, <laughs> the whole system has to be aware of this. So it uh, it means that all the corners of the system have to be have to be able to to think about oh, what environment am I working in with these terms, which is an important thing to do anyway. So it's it's kind of helped me think about how the system overall should be structured. But crucially, I haven't used dependent types just for the sake of it. You know, they're there, and I could, in theory, prove a lot of interesting things about. Uh, parts of the compiler, but practically, I don't find it very useful to do that. It doesn't. It doesn't help me. Uh, it doesn't help me run programs. It doesn't help me uh, type check interesting examples. I have tests for that. You know, controversial. I know. I, sometimes I even write tests first. Um, but I have the. I have the dependent types on the core representation uh, to to keep me right. And then I will only introduce a dependent type if it turns out I need it for either a mistake I keep making, which does happen uh, regularly. Um, so in some uh, smaller corners of the system, uh, or often if it's to ensure totality. So I'm always looking to write uh, functions that uh, that are guaranteed at least to cover all of their inputs. 
um, which sometimes means restricting the input type a little bit, and ideally um, to, to show that they terminate as well. That's not all that's possible. So that's that's the two things. Firstly, you'll think really carefully about the core representation. Think about the invariants that are absolutely crucial to maintain, and then maybe introduce the old dependent type here and there if you find that it'll start helping you in the smaller fragments of the system. Oh, one thing to say, I do actually use vectors. Um, I, but I only use them for um, uh, primitive operators because primitive operators have a particular arity and having a vector for the length, of, for, for the uh, operands, it turns out to be a really handy thing to do. But um, yeah, vectors are kind of tired, aren't they? <laughs> but uh, you know, they're sometimes useful. So that brings us into two questions that I wanted to discuss with you all. And so maybe we can, uh, let me ask both of those questions together and then we'll hear what the rest of you have to say on the topic. So th the first question is um, how ambitious to be with dependent types? Like there's the very easy application where we make, we check the vectors or a particular length, or we might um, do like Xavier Leroy and prove that our compiler can never generate incorrect code. And there's a whole spectrum in between those two. And one question that I think is interesting to try and answer, when you, especially when you're starting out, is where is the biggest bang for the buck? Where do you get the biggest response, uh, you know, the biggest value from dependent types? And the other question, which is a bit linked to that, is what is the story on dependent types and testing? You know, do we still need to do it? Well, Edwin, I, I understand that we do from you. Um, do the types help with testing? Do they hinder with testing? How do those fit together? Who would like to say something on this topic? Stephanie? OK. I'll, um, so in terms of testing, I, I, I'm totally with Edwin, right? We, we have to test our code. And I have written enough programs to know that even things that type check, believe it or not, may actually be wrong, even dependently type things. I have had many, many bugs. Um, whether testing hinders or dependent types makes testing harder or easier, I think that's a little bit more uh, a factor of what are you programming in the first place that determines whether the thing is hard to test or easy to test. I think that makes a your domain that you're working in makes a, a much larger difference versus whether you have a, a very precisely characterized type system. It is the case that I think the more precisely you can characterize the invariants of your code, perhaps the fewer things that you need to test. And so you can focus your testing attention on the parts that you're not very good at capturing with the type system. And so it can help you in that respect. Um, in terms of and here, I think I'm going to like hijack the discussion and go back and give one more example of dependent types because I forgot that I, or it just occurred to me that I had one to say that we didn't mention before. And I wanted to bring it up, right? So one thing that got me into dependent types in the first place was wanting to do some kind of reflection or generic programming. Being able, it's kind of the opposite, right? right? We talk about dependent types as types that have terms inside of them. But sometimes we want to have terms that have types inside of them. We want to have our programs depend on some of the abstractions of our code, the type structure. And, and Adam mentioned this a little bit, being able to write very generic operations for your database or being able to reflect on things that are normally just tracked by the type system. And I just wanted to point out that that's yet another category where I believe dependent types have much to offer and can really help uh, programmers uh, uh, in, in their development. Now, in terms of um, how ambitious you can be, I think you can be very ambitious, but I think you may not even know how ambitious you're being because sometimes you may be using dependent types without actually realizing it. For example, if I write a library and internal to my library, I use some dependent types to verify some invariants of that library, I don't have to give a dependently typed interface to that, right? If I've used the types only for correctness, 
I can keep my dirty secrets to myself. I don't have to tell you that. And I can present a much simpler, more traditionally typed interface to that library. And perhaps uh, you will just benefit in terms of the stability without have to pay for it in terms of complexity. Do we have somebody else wanted to comment on that? Nikki? Yeah, actually, it's Oh, ah, who's let first? Nikki go first. Nikki first. Uh, okay. Nikki, okay. So um, I want to comment on testing and dependent types. So I mean, I agree with Stephanie. Sometimes you can have your program verify and still have bugs. Uh, but I still like to believe that if, if my verifier, my checker says yes, I trust it. And I believe that I don't need to do the extra step of testing. Like for some reason, I believe verification more than testing. If you put all the effort to do the verification. I think one very nice combination between uh, testing and verification is that generally verification is very difficult to explain to you why it fails to verify. So the more complicated the verification is, the more error says, I cannot prove this. And these are all the internal details that the user is not supposed to understand. So I think like this is a very nice combination. When verification fails for some reason and hands waves and says, try to understand why, then you can have a layer of testing and it gives you a very nice counter example and then things make sense all of a sudden. So this is like my take on uh, between like a very nice combination of testing and verification. And now uh, the first question was um, how ambitious can you be and uh, so the way that I see it is that um, you have some critical parts of your program that you don't want to hit. So for example, like the standard example is this division by zero. So you add the precondition that says, when you divide, prove me that the second argument is different than zero. And then this, uh, like some function uses division. And then so when I call it, I need to prove this back there. And then this requires one more assumption of the function. So like you start from very critical things that you want to make sure that your program is not going to hit. And then these things propagate as functions call other functions. And now it's up to you, like what exactly you want these critical parts to be. So you can say, I don't want division by zero. You can say, I don't want to index out of index um, to list, to index list uh, out of index. Or you can say like even more fancy properties. And it's up to you how much you want to specify. Torsten, you had a comment also. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, I have an admission uh, to make. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching uh, a course uh, to introduce people, master students, to programming, and uh, I'm using Python. Yeah, OK. Uh, yeah, and it not only it is, I mean, it's sort of you can do functional things in it, but it's dynamically typed. Mm. And, and my justification for this is actually when I teach people programming, I, I don't want at the same time to teach them the dynamic semantics and the static one. I first want them uh, to explore the dynamic one to understand what it means to, to run a program. And, and also, I don't want them, if they have a complicated type system, they, they usually they, they write a program and then the compiler says no. And they say, oh, the stupid compiler, I've got this beautiful program. The compiler just doesn't let me run it. You know? But if they just have a dynamically uh, typed system, they run it and it crashes and it's their fault. Yeah? But this is not, in my mind, it's not a contradiction. There's a whole spectrum from, from a dynamically typed program to a completely verified program. Yeah? And what we want to do is we want to move within the spectrum. And actually, the nice thing about dependent types, I should mention this, is that dynamic typing can be represented with independently the full blown, full spectrum dependent types, just a pair of a type and a value. So, so what I think is when we do software development, we have different phases. We have sometimes prototyping phases, exploration. We just try something out. And we don't want to be restricted uh, because we don't know exactly what is important, what matters. We just write a, a stupid program which crashes. Yeah? But then we want to consolidate this program. And, and how far we go with this consolidation is not a fixed goal. It depends very much on your requirements, on, 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 on the problem, and so on. So, so how far you go, whether you, you use like uh, what Edwin is doing, you use just enough types, 
uh, you need in the compiler, or whether you actually verify the compiler, or you don't bother at all and, and, and have a dynamically typed program which crashes. This depends very much on what you want to do, but you want to be able to exploit the whole spectrum. That's the point. So let's stick with dynamic languages a little bit. I mean, some people say that uh, a language like Python that is dynamic makes you more productive because you don't have to fix your bugs before you can start running your code. And other people will say that um, a statically typed language will enable you to get your code working most quickly. So if you were to, suppose you just want to get something done. You want to build a piece of software, you know what you want to do, and you want to build it quickly and effectively. Would you use Python, Haskell, or Agda? Who would like to address that? Is my hand not showing up? I can't see you, Adam, I'm afraid. Adam, please. OK. Um, so my answer there, I don't know if I'll literally answer it in terms of that menu of three languages. But my experience is that if you're working on a project of at least moderate complexity, there's going to be a fair amount of shape to it and the way that its parts fit together. And as you go through exploratory programming, you'll be making small to medium sized to large changes in the shape and the way things fit together. And it's super helpful to have the compiler telling you, these are the parts of the code you need to change because you, you modified the basic way that the pieces snap together. I think if you choose types that say too much that are getting towards functional correctness when you don't even know what your system is going to do because you're still in such an exploratory phase, then that would, would certainly slow you down. You'd be expending effort and it would take longer to, to finish an experiment with a new feature. But if you're just checking basic sanity properties that probably are even necessary to keep the system from, from crashing, then a uh, more expressive language of shapes can really help you there and help the compiler give you better advice uh, about how to make changes that correlate with another change that you made. Nikki, did you have a comment on this? No, I think Thurston's picture was a very descriptive one. What language to use? Uh, I don't, like, uh, I think if it is a template, you wouldn't need to, to use all the verification principles. Like, from the choices, I would use Haskell. Uh, I mean, after programming, I don't know how many years in Haskell, I found it very difficult to understand untyped languages. So I, I don't know how to search for documentation, to be honest. <laughs> like, I have to read what its function is doing. Um, yeah, but like my experience is also that if I implement, okay, yes, I will implement it faster, but then it will crash easier, and then I don't want to see the code again. So I think it's worth the effort. So um, Tosten brought up teaching. So uh, another question is, who are dependent types for, really? Uh, are we one day going to be teaching them in Programming 101? Should we be doing that? teaching beginning programmers? Or are they a tool, are they a, now and always going to be a tool for expert developers who are building the core of an application that has to be most reliable? Who would you say they are for? I certainly vote for expert developers, though I don't know what is the exact fraction of developers that it will turn out to be less than 50%. I mean, Oh yeah, I, I, this sort of reminded me of something that uh, Stephanie said uh, a moment ago. Um, firstly, I, I, somehow I feel that we're interneting wrong in that we're not arguing enough. And I think part of the reason we're not arguing enough is because uh, of this whole spectrum of what you can do with dependent types. You can either be extremely precise about what you want to do, or you can be completely dynamic, especially with things like you know QTT that allows you to inspect types at runtime as well. Um, so yeah, going back to the sort of the who is it for? Stephanie mentioned earlier that you can write uh, libraries that internally use lots and lots of dependent types uh, internally, but you never have to expose that in the interface. So it's entirely possible, at least in theory, not in practice right now, but in theory, you could have a dependently typed language as your first programming language that you give to your 
let's say your, your incoming uh, undergraduates, assuming they've never programmed before. Um, but you never expose that it's a dependently typed language. And then gradually, as, as you introduce more sophisticated parts of programming to them, um, you introduce more of the dependently typed uh, facilities because maybe one day it will be useful for some application they're going to write. So I don't see any reason why dependent types shouldn't be something that uh, all developers have available to them in their language, even if most of the time uh, you're not going to use them. So <laughs> please, please tell me I'm wrong, because then it would be more fun. Would you say it's even clear that functional programming at the level of Haskell is accessible to a majority of programmers? Uh, I don't see any reason why not. I'm not going to say it's easy for a majority of programmers because the evidence is that people come along, they try Haskell, and they struggle with it, and then eventually something clicks. Um, but I don't think it's beyond uh, the typical developer. I, you know, developers are smart people. Can I also, I, I wanted to make a provocative remark to have a, a discussion a little bit. I think uh, Haskell is really a very problematic language because I think it's very, very complicated. And it's so complicated because it doesn't have dependent types. Uh, so, so if you want uh, to, to teach something easy, something simple, dependent types are actually the answer. And I want to make another provocative remark uh, to uh, Adam and Stephanie. Uh, this like uh, these, these like two level languages, uh, uh, they are really, I call them pre-Newtonian. I mean, like like Haskell, you have the, 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 you have numbers on the level of types, and you have numbers uh, on on uh, in your in your programs. And there's two different uh, numbers, as, as Adam says, a copy of the of the simple type lambda calculus or lambda calculus ever. But that's a bit it's horrible, complicated, right? Uh, I thought it's pre-Newtonian because before Newton, uh, people believed there are different laws on Earth and in the heavens, right? And Newton sort of unified uh, uh, the laws by law of gravity and so on. And I think dependent types do something like this. Yeah, instead of having a full blown depend or full spectrum dependent types, do exactly this. Instead of having this very weird distinction of having numbers which live in heaven and numbers which live on earth, you just have numbers. So. But then a lot of the pragmatics work out better in that setting, like uh, efficient compilation and, and type inference. I think Adam is talking about erasure, the the very old coincidence that we erase all the types but leave all the terms. And of course, we're smarter than that now. We can actually look and see what we actually use as opposed to deciding a priority at the beginning of the universe. We're always going to erase these things no matter how we want to use them. And we're never going to erase these things. Um, uh, I think we have a really lots of really good designs about how to incorporate erasure into our languages that don't require this two level languages like Torsten is talking about. And I I personally love to get rid of that distinction in Haskell, but there's a lot of very silly, um, I don't wanna break all existing Haskell programs reasons for not uh, blurring that distinction. I agree with Orson that that uniformity, the fact that you're required in the semantic, like the semantics of a, of a number doesn't matter of whether it's a type or whether it's a term, right? You want it to have the same semantics in either context, right? That uniformity is gonna make your language easier to understand. If you have to think, well, over here, numbers mean slightly different things than no numbers over here. That's just, that's madness. That's gonna lead to lots of confusion. But I don't think that's the only problem. And I don't think that's the only reason why dependently typed programming in Haskell these days, it can be a little bit complicated. So Nikki has been waiting to say something. Nikki, yes, um, I, I think like uh, there is another issue that prevents the um, people using dependent types. And like I am on the side that I would like to see dependent types used by more than 50%. And but I think one reason why they're not so, so like broadly used is the user experience, right? Somebody in the chat already mentioned type errors. I think this is like a very uh, preventing feature. If you see something that you don't understand and you don't give it a second thought. And uh, maybe looking at Haskell's history, like, I don't know, 10 years ago, you had to install DHC from scratch and you had the Cabal Hell and all this like mess. 
And then uh, the building system got a lot improved and man many more users started building it. And I don't think Haskell is difficult. Like, I don't think it is more difficult than Python. It's definitely like Haskell's type system. I don't think it's more difficult than Rust, that Rust like explodes. So I, I see Rust type system and I'm like, how can people use it? It's so complicated. So it's more about the user development. So if we put a lot of effort on the site, like, what happens around the systems, dependent type systems, it will be accessible to many more programmers. Edwin, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> I'll turn my mic on. Uh, I wanted to sort of uh, echo that and expand on that. I think we need to move away from programming languages being a thing that you feed your complete program to and it says no in return because that's pretty, pretty much what happens. So it's really, the experience is really important. We need to move into programming being like a conversation with the machine. So you don't routinely get type errors because what you've done is as you've come to a bit of your program you haven't figured out yet and you leave a hole. And at some point you have to figure out uh, how to fill in that hole. So um, as language designers and developers, I think that's probably the next thing that we need to think about seriously is um, the development experience. So hang on, I've got, a, I've got my, my favorite programming language here. So this is, this is basically programming. You fill the holes just like, here you've got your specification and you fill in the values. So yeah. that was all. Can I add one more comment in this thread? Um, so I think it's easy to think about the relative friction of different programming language features from the baseline of, I'm building a very complicated compiler. And it's so hard to begin with that I don't notice if I spend a moderate amount of time on wrangling with a type checker. And if you think about what most programmers are spending most of their time doing every day, they're doing much more routine things where they're not actually facing that kind of intellectual challenge. And it really changes their experience to add the intellectual challenge of figuring out what a complex type checker is doing. And that's why I think very, predictable type inference is super important for most kinds of potential uses of dependent types in the real world. And it's hard to get that level of predictability if you have such an expressive type system. That, that's why I'm more in favor of type system that has cut out most of the features of the term level programming language, but in return, you get a very predictable inference engine. So let, let me bring up a, another topic. When you write dependently typed code, you have to get it through the type checker, and you're essentially doing a little bit of a proof about your program. And that provides encouragement to write your program in a way that matches a nice proof. And that isn't necessarily going to be the most performant way to write the code. So what is the story on dependent types and performance? Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> so I, when you posed this question before, I, I pushed back and said that I didn't like how you asked this question because it implies that dependent types only hinder performance, right? Without opening the question of whether you can use dependent types to make your code faster, right? And I, and I have seen evidence of the fact that sometimes if you're expressing your uh, memory layout in a certain way that is enabled by having a very expressive type system, you can achieve mem uh, performance benefits, right? I'm specifically thinking of some blog posts on the Jane Street blog about using Gadgets to, um, to uh, increase the speed of some of their code. Um, so I would say that the jury is still out. We don't have a lot of performance studies for dependently typed programming language. Uh, we're only just now getting some implementation of, uh, of dependently typed programming languages that actually do uh, care about performance in the first place. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're only going to lead to slower, more correct code. I would think that they might also lead to faster, more correct code. Can I just go into the same uh, um, place? Because actually, Sometimes, if you, if you want to write a really fast algorithm, you have to keep track of lots of complicated invariants. And I think if you don't have if you, if you don't have the safety net that this is going to work, 
you, you may not do it. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that the dependency type code in many cases can be more efficient because you have the ability to do something very daring, to work very close to the uh, to the to the cliff. Yeah. But because you have the safety net of depend types, you are going to do it. Yeah. So, so I do think the con indeed the converse of what you just said is true. Dependent types make programs more efficient, not less, or enable you to write more efficient code. So that sounds plausible as an argument. Can you give examples of high performance code that's been developed that way? I, I had my hand up and then you said high performance and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Edward, no, please go ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know the answer either. I'm going to say that up front. Um, I also agree that we shouldn't say that dependent types are going to make things slow. I'll give you a plausible, maybe an example from, from the Idris 2 implementation, talking about names. Uh, the representation of names throughout the Idris 2 system is the Brown indices. So that's integers. So if anyone hasn't seen that, that's integers counting how long ago the name was defined, essentially. Now, if you were doing that in a language with without dependent types, then your program isn't going to work. I just know that it's not going to work. You have made a mistake somewhere. It's too hard. Um, so what I did in Idris 1 was there were certain points where I defensively change to a different representation of names so that I can make sure that everything was unique and intact and then translate it back again. In Idris 2, I just go for it, no problem. I just keep everything as integers throughout. There's a proof that the variable is in scope and it is literally a machine integer that represents it. Uh, and I can look up from the environment with an integer and so on. So it's sort of what Torsten said, that I just I just go for it. This, this will be fine, the type check is keeping me right and I don't have to do these de defensive uh, conversions. So I don't know that's a convincing example, but it's, it's at least one from my own experience. I have another example that I'm not sure literally fits the, the prompt about dependent types, but it's it, I won't say much about it because it's going to be my, my talk at the main Lambda Days conference where we built a domain-specific compiler for cryptographic algorithms, which is, by the way, implemented using dependent types, but I think it's probably more important that there are separate functional correctness proofs about it. And so therefore, very paranoid crypto people are willing to use the outputs of the compiler in a way where they wouldn't accept a random pull request of some C code from someone out there who, who produced this kind of stuff. Okay. I found a very simple example uh, where, I mean, verification increases performance. And it is, so Haskell has a byte string uh, that is like um, a library that is accessing the memory di directly. And there is the unsafe version of byte string that actually is a wrapper around, around C. And then you have like the safe version of byte string that does a runtime check before like it sends, it checks inbound indexing and then goes and check uh, and uses the unsafe version. So like you can just use verification to check that you are inbound. So at runtime, you get rid of many runtime checks. I'll give one more anecdote along these lines. Because uh, so Edwin's story reminded me that I have the I have also been playing around with various implementations of variable binding and implementing lots of them, both with where the types keep track of the scoping and those that, where it doesn't keep track of the scoping and trying to benchmark them against each other to try to see which ones are faster and which ones are slower. Um, and Beginning of the story is that the, the the ones where the types keep track of the scoping, it, it, there is no cost, right? They are the same speed as the other one. But even just recently, I found on my GitHub repo, I got a pull request for somebody who had figured out how to make one of them faster. And the one that they had figured out how to make faster was the one where the types were keeping track of the scoping. And the, the author of the pull request said to me, I wouldn't have figured out what was going on if I didn't have the types there to tell me what's going on under the covers for this efficient implementation of scoping. I, in fact, I don't even really understand why this works, but I'm very confident that it does because I have the types to tell me that I haven't screwed up the scoping. OK, thank you very much, everybody. So um, I have. One more question that I want to ask all of you, and uh, this is dependent types are quite old now. They're, they're more than 50 years old. What impact do you think they'll be having on practical programming 
in, let's say, 10 or 20 years from now. Let's look 10 years ahead. That's always easy to be visionary. What are the visions here? Stephanie, would you like to start? OK. Um, yeah, this is a really hard question. But um, so one trend that we see now is in program synthesis of being able to, to try to use AI techniques for generating programs. Right. And I think dependent types are a really good vehicle for this because you, it's a way within the programming language to add extra constraints that you might have that can guide the synthesis process. Right. So it's not the case that um, it, I would hope that this would be a way to make programming independently typed languages even easier because as you make the types more precise, there are fewer programs that type check. So if there are fewer programs, it's easier to find the right one. And maybe all this hard efforts that we do for programming can be um, can be aided by some of the recent advances that we have in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Who else would like uh, to comment on that? Torsten. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a, I, I think we are aware that sort of programming or software uh, becomes more and more pervasive. And uh, is it, and while it is, well, it is very big effort to 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 write some software which comes with a certificate. Uh, I think uh, the price of failure also gets higher and higher. So, so, so I, I hope that there is sort of some economic pressure, which forces us to have more precise methods and real me methods which can be checked afterwards. This is this old story of proof carrying code, which was ahead of its time, but I think it's still a vision which which will happen at some point. It has to happen at some point, because otherwise the, the price the price we have to pay for for, for software which which we cannot trust. Uh, which, which we cannot ensure uh, is too high. So, so I think that there will be using dependent types and using other mechanisms, other ideas. Uh, 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 there will be a development for 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 more reliable, for certified software. Nikki, would you like to say something? Um, yes, I also see them. Like I think, like also from this panel. Uh, we agree that like dependent types get more and more into many languages, so they are slowly getting features of dependent types get more. And like in 10, 20 years, I would like to see them like in more mainstream programming languages with a lot of integration. Like Stephanie said, like you have some specification written in uh, light, let's say at least dependent types, and then you have a synthesis tool on the back that suggests how you should construct your program. But this, yes, as I mentioned before, for this to happen, we need to pay a lot of effort on uh, building the tools that make all this interaction a good user experience. And who, Adam, you haven't said anything on this yet. Oh, Edwin. Okay, Adam, go first. <laughs> okay. I, I can't see you, Adam. That's the problem. I'm shifty like that. Um, <laughs> so my general perspective, thinking about static verification techniques in general, where we might say dependent types is one instance of that, is that we will see increasing use of those techniques to establish the deep correctness properties of important infrastructure that's shared across many different applications. And I, I believe it will tend not to be economical to make that kind of investment in the applications themselves. But one great special case of infrastructure where dependent types, that, that phrasing taken literally are a good fit is domain specific language implementations and some other symbolic processing examples we already covered. And I think we're, we've already seen a lot of, of uptake in the functional programming community of this kind of expressive typing for language implementations. And I would expect that that trend will just keep accelerating. At the same time as we see a parallel world involving not so much programming languages as proof assistants and verification tools and so on that are, that are applied to establish 
deep program specific theorems for uh, smaller amounts of code that is used more widely. And Edwin, your turn. Uh, yeah, so um, this is kind of what Nikki said in a way and sort of a bit what uh, everyone else has said, but I think we need to be looking beyond the functional programming world, um, cool as functional programming is. Um, so for me, a measure of success, long-term success, is not is Idris used by everyone in the world because or well, every programmer because I can't keep I can't keep up maintenance on that. But are the ideas that we're coming out with here, so the refinement types and the dependent Haskell and are the full dependent types and Idris, are they being adopted by mainstream programming languages? Is the next a big mainstream language that Apple give to their programmers, does that have a little bit of dependent types in it? So we're now all used to, in an IDE, you type X dot and you get a whole load of options for what the next bit of your program is. Dependent types give you so much more about you know, what that drop down box will contain. So can we get our ideas on type synthesis and fancy types far enough into the mainstream programming, imperative programming world, so that that drop down box is more useful to everyday programmers. That's um, kind of summarizing what everyone else said, but there you go. 